This lesson is about constrained optimization, and this is one of my favorite topics in applied calculus, actually. Um, what is constrained optimization? Well, in earlier lessons, you've already learned a bit about optimization, you know, finding the local or the global maximum or minimum of some function. Uh, but the question is, what if not all of that function is accessible? In other words, like, what if you're not looking in the entire domain of the function to find the max or the min? And in case you're wondering what I'm talking about, let's make this con concrete uh, with an example. So say there's a company and you're interested in it, the company's production, okay? And the amount of stuff that this company is able to produce depends on some quantities X and Y of two different raw materials. And you have some model for the production. Like if you have, uh, you know, X quantities of, you know, if you have X units of the first raw material and Y units of the second raw material, the production is given by this function that I've written down here. Well, the unconstrained maximization problem is just to say, maximize the production. Well, if you look at this function, and if you can't see it from just looking, you can try plotting it, the answer is that to make the function as large as possible, to get the largest amount of production, you should make x and y as large as possible, which is infinity. You should choose x equals infinity, y equals infinity, and you'll produce an infinite amount of stuff. Obviously, this is very unrealistic, and the reason is that, you know, companies have constraints, and in particular, they can't have an infinite amount of raw materials because they only have a certain amount of money. And so this leads to what's known as the constrained problem, okay? And the constraint is to maximize production given that each unit of X and Y costs $100, and your company only has a total budget to spend on materials of $378,000, okay? That's an example of a constrained problem. It says you're not allowed to choose any values of x and y that you want to maximize this function. You have to choose x and y so that the total cost of them adds up to less than $378,000. This type of problem turns out to be known uh, as a uh, Lagrange multiplier problem, and you'll learn exactly what that means in a moment. Um, in your textbook, you may have seen a lot of technical things about solving Lagrange multiplier problems analytically. We're not going to focus on that. What's important to me is that you understand how to set up these problems, how to interpret them, and how to solve them using graphical methods. That's what we're going to focus on. So a little bit of important terminology here. Um, the objective function uh, in a Lagrange multiplier problem is the thing that you would like to optimize, the thing you want to find the maximum or minimum of. So I want to make sure you know this term, because we'll use it. And the constraint is the restriction that's placed on the independent variables. It's the thing that tells you you're only allowed to look at you know, certain values of x and y. Now, this next point will be hard for you to grasp, possibly, until I show you a picture on the next slide. But graphically, the critical points of the function, the potential maxes and mins, are where the constraint is tangent to the objective function contours in a contour diagram. That might sound really confusing for now. It's going to become really natural when I show you a picture. Okay? There's also a quantity called the Lagrange multiplier. We frequently symbolize it with this Greek letter lambda, and it's kind of like a derivative. Okay? So what the Lagrange multiplier tells you is the change you get in the optimal value of the objective function if your constraint increased by a unit. So thinking about the example on the previous slide, we were thinking about the production of a company. The Lagrange multiplier would tell you if you had an additional dollar to spend on materials, how much additional stuff could you produce? And it has the units of the objective function divided by the units of the constraint. So let's, let's try to take all of this and make it much more clear with a couple of examples. So this is a kind of abstract example. Let's try to find the extremum of this function subject to x plus y equals 100. Okay? We'd also like to estimate the Lagrange multiplier lambda. Always begin by trying to clearly uh, articulate what's the objective function. Well, it's the thing we want to extremize. That's, we'll call it f of xy. It's x squared plus 4xy. The constraint is that x plus y must equal 100. Okay? And I, the way I would like you to think of this is that there is another function, g of xy, which is equal to x plus y, and that I am forcing you to be on the contour of this function that has the value 100. Okay? And so the way we're going to solve this is just by plotting it. So what you're seeing in this uh, plot down here, the blue contours are contours of this function f. I want you to ignore the green curve for now. What this red curve is, is it's the constraint. So this is the curve x plus y equals 100 right here. 
So what constrained maximization means is that you're not allowed to look for the highest value of the function in this whole graph. You're only allowed to look for the highest value of the function as you walk along this line. So like we can ask, you know, is the highest value here? Well, the value of the function is a little bit less than 13,000, right? If I look here, it's equal to 13,000 because I'm crossing the 13,000 contour. And it actually looks like the biggest value is probably somewhere around here. And what you have to imagine is that there are, of course, other contours, ones that we haven't drawn in. Um, but there's some contour that's kind of parallel to the 13,000 one. Right, and it looks like this. And you can notice that the constraint and that imaginary contour are tangent. They're just tangent exactly at this point. So literally, this is the whole solution to the problem. You just look at the constraint, you find the point that has the largest value of the objective function along that constraint. And so we're going to estimate here the x-coordinate. If I look down, it looks like maybe it's around, I don't know, x equals maybe 68, let's say, and y equals, I don't know, maybe 34. And to estimate the value of the objective function there, I can note that I'm less than half the way from 13,000 to 15,000. So I'm, it's probably less than 14,000. Maybe I'll say that f is equal to about 13,500, okay? That's, if you wanted to get a, that's a rough estimate. If you wanted to get a better um, sense, you could make a, a more uh, zoomed in plot and try to, to get a more accurate answer. Okay, so that's the answer to the first question. Um, we should also say whether this is a max or a min, and clearly as we walk along this constraint, um, values are smaller than 13,000 here. At our point here, it's, a, uh, it's at 13,500, so it has to be a local maximum. So this is, a, this is a max. For the second part, I want you to estimate the Lagrange multiplier, and we have to remember that the Lagrange multiplier means change in the optimum, optimum value, divided by change in the constraint. Okay, so I've drawn in another curve here. It's this green one, and this is the line x plus y equals 110 instead of 100. It's like we added 10 extra dollars to our budget or something like that. Okay, so we could look at what the optimum is for this point, and it looks like maybe it would occur here, and maybe the optimum looks like it's about halfway between 15,000 and 17,000, so maybe it would be at this point f equals 16,000. Okay, just a guess an estimate. So now we can estimate the Lagrange multiplier as the change in the optimum. So that's 16,000 minus 13,500 divided by the change in the constraint. The constraint started out at the uh, 110 con at the 100 contour um, and then we went up to the 110 contour. So this gives us a value of 2,500 over 10 which is 250. That's our estimate for the Lagrange multiplier. That's the first example. The second example, we won't make a plot, but we'll do some more interpreting here. So you have set aside 20 hours uh, to work on two class projects, and you would like to maximize your grade measured in points, which depends on how you divide your time between the two projects. So first we'll ask, what is the objective function and what are its units? Well, objective function, that's the thing we're trying to maximize in this case, um, and that's your total grade and its units are points, reading from the information above. What is the constraint? The constraint is that you only have 20 hours in your week, uh, actually per week isn't so relevant here, it's just a total amount of time. You only have 20 hours here to uh, work on your project, and you have to choose how to allocate between them. So suppose you want to solve the problem by the method of Lagrange multipliers, what are the units for lambda? Well, the units are always the units of the objective function, divided by the units of the constraint. Units of the objective function are points, units of the constraint are hours, so Lagrange multiplier has units points per hour. What is the practical meaning of the statement lambda equals five? Well, the Lagrange multiplier always means the change in the optimum, change in the optimal value, given a unit increase in the constraint. So here, unit increase in the constraint means pretend you had an additional hour to devote to your projects. And what lambda equals five means, if you have that additional hour, you could increase your optimal grade by five points. 
Okay, here we've come to the end of the lesson. I want you to ask yourself if you can explain the difference between constrained and unconstrained optimization, if you can identify the objective function and the constraint in, an, in a Lagrange multiplier problem, if you can solve Lagrange multiplier problems graphically, and if you can determine and interpret the Lagrange multiplier. Thanks for listening.